Okay, good to see everyone this morning, and I said it last week, I can see everyone. It's like double space on a typewriter. <laughs> yeah, a lot of folks beginning to go north, and they're fearing the summertime, and I hope they find a pretty day like we got out there right now, wherever they're going. Uh, we do know that we are expecting hot weather to come. Uh, but even that's better than some of the ice and snow that some of them dodge, amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Jude. We're still in it and say, how long are you going to be there? Well, I'm sort of hoping the Lord will come before I get through with it. Uh, we finished the book of Revelation and some of you accused me of dragging it out, hoping the Lord would come before I got through. And so then we tried 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He still didn't come. So we're hoping he comes by the end of Jude here. Uh, would that be all right? I think it would. Is anybody having it so good you don't think it would get better if the Lord come? That's a foolish question, isn't it? But sometime I see some folks, and I've joked with the young people through the years about it when I start preaching on the Lord coming real soon. And I realized I was hitting a negative note for some of them. They had plans, you know. And I'd often say to them, I know some of you are planning on getting married, but listen, the Lord can save you from that if he, if he <laughs> comes on early. And that didn't go over too good with the younger folks. Let them get married a few years, and the bills start coming in, and the struggle of life gets a little different. And then they'll say, well, my preacher might have been right about that, you know. Amen. All right, uh, let's jump into it because Jude is only about 600 and what, eight words, I guess. But all oh, how they're packed full. Man, this is a full little book. And we're going we're gonna to run some of the references occasionally on it. That's why it's going to take longer. You know, a uh, uh, little boy said, God said what he meant, meant what he said. He didn't stutter when he spoke. And he's right. The words are so full, they take you so, uh, so deep in so many ways. And all the references that we can run on the subjects that Jude brings up here in the book, if you do that, it'll be a, be a blessing to you. And uh, we recognize here that uh, probably written, probably written about 68 AD according to all the scholarship and study. Uh, but we find that it takes us all the way basically to the end of the tribulation period. Now, when I say that, hope you understand we're expecting the rapture next. Then we're expecting the day of Jacob's trouble, the seven years of tribulation that's identified in the book of uh, Daniel. And so, as we studied the book of Revelation, we came to the end of the tribulation period when the Lord comes back at the battle of Armageddon and uh, uh, faces the nations and all their artillery and has to, the creator has to fight his creatures to take his creation back. Isn't that something? But he does. He sets up his kingdom. So when you get to the end here of uh, uh, some of the references in Jude, you are referencing that time. We talked about it already um, where he said that he's going to come back with 10,000 of his saints. Verse 14, quoting uh, what Enoch said about it. And uh, that would take us to the time the Lord comes back leading the armies of heaven. We as believers, we're interested and excited that the Lord's coming for his bride, for his saved people. He's coming to, uh, and take us up in the, what we call the rapture. And we, we're excited about that. But I've said this before, God's more excited about when his son comes back and takes the kingdom. Uh, you read Psalms chapter 2, how that the... The heathen rage, the nation's rage against the idea that God is one day going to set his son on Zion's hill, on the throne. He is literally going to rule from Jerusalem on the throne of David. Now, Jerusalem today is not what it will be then. You actually have a reference where the Lord spoke of Jerusalem as being Sodom in Egypt. Now, that's not a very good uh, description but uh, it would fit that description more today. Yeah. <clears throat> but it will not when the Lord comes back and rules and reigns. Then it will truly be the holy city. 
we talk about it now and, and uh, it's a beautiful song about the holy city and I like all that but it won't be holy till the holy one comes back himself and sits on the, on, on the throne <clears throat> you talk to the missionaries today a sin in Jerusalem is just like it is here in America uh, close to as bad <laughs> we're getting some, I think we're gaining on the whole world in America right now but um, it will be a change when the Lord comes back with 10,000 of his saints, as Jude said, and as is quoted here. In the meantime, we have all these historical examples. We find the book was written here uh, in verses 2 and 3. It says we're to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Folks, if there's ever been a day and time we needed to contend for the truth, it's today. There's a lot of people... Lost people don't know any Bible, but they know something's bad wrong with the world. They know just by nature itself that sin now is against nature. It's against anything. Let, let me give you a little thought. And some of you preachers might make a big message on this if you thought about it. What we're seeing today is anything God established as truth is under attack. Stuff that was accepted by lost people through the years, by nature, the natural man said this is right or this is wrong. Now there is an organized effort to go against anything. Let's, let's take, what, what did God ordain? He ordained marriage, did he? Yeah. Is marriage under attack, attack today? It certainly is, like we've never seen it. And there's a lot of young people now brainwashed into thinking marriage is unnecessary. No, I want to tell you something. That's a, God, a covenant God established. And uh, we're seeing an attack on the home, on the family, on the institution of marriage. And then things we thought was untouchable, we're seeing it so bad today, they're going after the kids while they're still hardly in kindergarten yeah. to brainwash them into the corruption and evil that they want accepted today. I'm start, going to start off in the verses this morning. We, we talked about here about the angels left their first estate. We're talking about going after strange flesh. We're talking about that one of the signs of the days of Noah was sex perversion. Isn't that in the news today? Every, everywhere you can turn. And then it says in verse 7, even as, in other words, moves very easily here from the evil of the fallen angels into Sodom and Gomorrah. Now Sodom and Gomorrah, we have the story in the Old Testament, how God rained fire and judgment on them. We also find out that a man that probably is an example of a backslidden believer as anybody ever was, was a, was a man named Lot, remember? He was where he didn't belong. He left Abraham. He looked on the well-watered plains of the Jordan. He looked on the more wealth he could have. And he'd gone into that sinful city, and if you read the story close, he had moved himself to where he sat at the gate. In other words, that was the commissioner's meeting. That was the mayor's uh, office. That was the government of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he had a position in them. Now, we don't have any sense from the scripture of, of how much Lot partook of it, but the Bible says, Peter said, he vexed his righteous soul with the evil or the sin, or the wickedness. And so if it vexed him, he knew he was doing wrong. If it vexed his soul, he had some standard he was violating. And of course, uh, being nephew of Abraham, he knew what was right and wrong. And so, uh, so Lot was in the wrong place. Did it cost him? It sure did. It not only cost him his wife being turned to a pillow of salt. You say, that didn't really happen. Well, the Bible said it did. Amen. So I'll, I'll go along with it. Somebody said, you don't believe that whale swallowed Jonah. Yeah, and I believe it if God said Jonah swallowed the whale. Yep. If God said it. You say, pillow of salt. I remember the first trip we made to Israel when it was on the tour bus and it was out there around the uh, Black Sea and uh, that area. Uh, uh, in fact, they're not exactly sure where Sodom and Gomorrah was, but they think it might have been, or might even find some evidence of it today at the bottom of the Black Sea, because that's the lowest place on earth. And in the Black Sea, not the, uh, we call it the Dead Sea, uh, it, um, 
is dead because everything goes into it, doesn't get out, it becomes the salt. They call it salt sea. Uh, we've been to it, and uh, you've heard that you can go swimming in, in it, and you, you'll float. Yeah, and you'll not only do that, you'll burn. <laughs> it's got that salt in it. So, uh, yeah, I went into it. I was younger and more stupid than now. Uh, I wouldn't do it again. But they also have those uh, water pipes around the edge of it. You can call them showers. So you can get out, and you better get out quick and get in one of them and wash the stuff off of you. Uh, it is that salty, and it will burn, and especially tender parts of your body, your lips and ears and so forth. So it's a good chance. That's where Sodom and Gomorrah was, good chance where the judgment of God fell on them. And, and it, they actually harvest uh, uh, potash and chemicals and stuff out of the Dead Sea and uh, make a lot of uh, money off of it. But Sodom and Gomorrah was real places, real sin holes. And the same sin that was brought God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah is now running rampant even in America right. and increasing all the time. Yep. Now, it's, we've seen this coming for years, but we've never seen it like it is right now. It is snowballing. If you understand anything about the exponential curve, how that something builds and builds, in nuclear talk, it's critical mass. Uh, it explodes all of a sudden. In other words, something builds and builds and then bang all at once. And uh, I fear we're getting really close to that explosion time. That critical mass of sin is building where God's judgment can no longer continually uh, have the long suffering and the grace that he's given. I can't set a date, but I can say this. I can't imagine at the rate it's going it's increasing now. I can hardly imagine how it could go four or five more years. Maybe not four or five more days. Uh, who knows? But we have it plainly stated in the Bible. Uh, and here we have Sodom and Gomorrah being used as an example of God's judgment falling, his fire falling on it. So I, I read here, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them, there were some little cities around them, neighborhoods around them. You remember when the angels drug Lot out? They told him to go. He said, but I want to stop here. And they said, no. He said, but this is just a little one. That's, <laughs> preachers preach on little sins because little sins is where it starts and builds and grows and explodes. So Lot argued with the angels of God, don't take me too far. Let, let me stop. And then, of course, he committed even the incest sin in his drunken state with his daughters. And if you study the, the kids they had from that relationship was a, was a thorn in Israel's side as you study through the uh, Old Testament. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. If you keep up with any news at all today, every almost every day you hear something that's so absurd, you say, that couldn't be, could it? Any of you notice how that uh, big corporations now are going what they call woke and they got to have homosexuals hired on their staff. They got to promote their, yeah. their goods. No. Did anybody see the news on the Target store? Am I, well, my wife has been known to shop in Target and I'm looking at a bunch of you that have. But they started stocking homosexual materials for the kids. Did you see that? Uh, I'm not going to try to describe it, but it's awful, some of the stuff. And some of it was satanic stuff. See, the two go together. Homosexuality and, and satanic stuff parallel and run together. I heard one man say on TV, uh, he was probably a Christian, but not a preacher, he, he said, folks, we got to face it. This is pure evil. This is satanic. Yeah. And though millions would hear that, and, and if it make any common sense, they can recognize it. Still, people just go along with it. Now, I did hear where Target had lost, what was it, $4 billion quickly after they came out with that stuff. And then I saw, I saw 
on the news, and I, I don't follow baseball like I did when I was younger a little bit, but the L.A. Dodgers now, it used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers, I believe, they, uh, they had that queer team of uh, men dressed as women pretending to be Catholic nuns that mock the crucifixion and mock everything Christian, showing a picture of a half-nude man crucified upside down in a vulgar way, mocking all of that. And then they had him out to the pitcher, not the pitcher's mound, but the home plate in front of the, that big stadium. Now, I understand some of the players are revolting on that. They ought to revolt on it. I hope they will. But how absurd can it be? How much more in our face can they put that stuff? It is so amazing that they, that they would do that. Uh, and then I cried all night when I heard that one of the big homosexual organizations had warned their people about it might be dangerous to come to Florida. I just cried all night about that, didn't you? <laughs> I'd like to see them put a big sign at the Florida line. <laughs> <laughs> Let me paint it. I'll pay for the paint. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'd have a word for him. Oh, listen. Listen, it's so ridiculous. Hey, by the way, you say, that's unkind. Well, God must be unkind. I, I see in the book of Revelation where the holy city is going to have walls around it. And nothing. No blemish can enter into it. No sin can enter into it. So... I'm, a, I'm in good company if God feels that way about some of it too. Amen? Amen. And I know this goes out over the radio. You've got a little knob there that goes on and off. If you've, been, if you've been brainwashed to the place, you think what I'm saying is wrong, you ought to turn it off. In fact, I won't say what you ought to do, but the truth of the matter is we have moved to a crazy place. But look, we got the scripture saying, telling us about Sodom and Gomorrah telling us these historical examples, warning us. So these things, you know, when I, when I grew up in this town, uh, I don't know if any of us knew the word homosexual. There'd be some gossip about somebody that might uh, uh, be one, but that was something you didn't talk about. That was something that just was off the scale. Well, look at it now. Now it's not only I want you to tolerate me. I want you to put me out front. Amen. I want you to join me. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. I mean, look at the White House. Yeah. It, well, it has. I started to say it ought to be painted a different color. It has been. When President Obama was in, they passed that bill, and then they decorated the White House in rainbow colors. You remember that? Yeah. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Well... <laughs> They probably should have left them up for the crowd they brought in there. Amen. Help yourself. I'm not the pastor. You can get mad at me, and it don't make a hill of beans to me at all. Uh, but the truth, the truth is, they're going crazy. The press secretary, the little uh, young-looking black girl, uh, French, she's lesbian, and that's a big promoting thing, that he hired a lesbian for that, by the way. So far, I've never heard her answer a question yet. <laughs> she, she is pretty good about dodging around. That's what, he, that's, that's what I guess the president wanted. And uh, look at the staff of the White House right now. Anybody know who Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg what is his name? Buttigieg. Anybody know who I'm talking about? He's the Secretary of Transportation, whatever that means. Uh, married to a man. Yeah, he speaks of his husband once in a while. He's promoted. He, he may even run for president. Uh, and you might be surprised. He'd probably get a few votes. America's the place now if the devil himself ran for president, he'd get some votes, I think. But with all that kind of foolishness, we're, we're right where God's fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Many years ago, when this stuff began to get started, nothing like it's run its course now. Billy Graham said, and it was pretty strong for, for Billy to say it, he said, if God does not judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yep. I understand that statement fits better now, don't it? 
of what we're, what we're seeing. Sad. But it says even as. In other words, as God judged them, he will bring that judgment again. Let's read some more on it. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, not just fornication. Fornication, fornication can be natural adultery and sin between uh, uh, men and women. But now it says strange flesh. That would take us over to Romans chapter 1 where it says they leave the natural use of the woman. Men lusting after men. I saw, I was flipping through and uh, news channels and I saw a commercial where they were advertising some pills for homosexual men to take to keep from having AIDS. That was what the commercial was. So to advertise the pills, they had two men kissing each other. What do y'all watch? Do y'all ever find, I find some awful stuff sometimes just flipping through for a little bit. And uh, sometimes I wish I hadn't, hadn't seen it. And in the course of it's pornographic, I won't, won't uh, uh, let it be on there a second. But uh, to see men making so-called love to men is about as nauseating to a real man as anything can be. And uh, that's what Paul says in Romans 1 when they're leaving the natural use, doing the unnatural thing. And uh, that's what we're seeing. Now, Romans chapter 1, Paul is telling why God brought judgment on the heathens that practice that. Just like Jude is saying now, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, as this judgment of God fell. I don't, folks, God has not changed that much. What he hated then, he still hates. You say, God don't hate. Yes, God does. The Bible says he does. And if you and I are right, we'll hate the same thing God hates. And that's not a bad word. It's a Bible word. We're to love the good and hate the evil. I know what you're fixing to say. Oh, he, he, he does hate the sin, but he loves the sinner. Uh-huh. But it also says he hated Esau. Check me out. After a guy has been warned and warned and continues in, 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 in sin, it's a very fine line between separating. Yeah, I, I, I hate the sin. I'd love to see every sinner saved. But... When a guy goes on like Esau did and some others, you can cross a line with God and it becomes where you can't hardly differentiate between the sin and the sinner. Become the same. And that's scary stuff, but that's Bible stuff. I can, I can debate you on that scripture for scripture. And so don't get all bent out of shape. These liberals have used the fact that God loves us to the place they want to make him love sin itself, and he does not. He judges sin. I park on Sodom and Gomorrah for a long time. I mentioned to you before the book of Jasher. It's mentioned a couple of times in the Bible, once in uh, Joshua. And anyway, it was an old book, not a Bible book, shouldn't be in the Bible. But it is a historical book written as old, probably as old written as the book of Job, which they think is about the oldest uh, writing they can have, even though the events of Job don't go back to Genesis 1. But in the book of Jasser, it describes the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it describes it very plain and makes you, as you read it, however much of it is true, and I think a big majority of it is true, or it would have been quoted in the Bible. But they say that for a stranger to come into Sodom and Gomorrah, he had to be initiated into the homosexual acts. That tells you what the angels were up against when they come in to rescue Lot. The men of the city came beating the door down. They wanted the young men, and angels always appear as young men in the Bible. They wanted the young men brought out so they could K-N-O-W know them. In the same relationship, the word is used between husband and wife uh, in the Bible. <clears throat> no. And uh, if they'd had the power, they would have initiated the very angels of heaven into their sin. But, of course, 
just a little bit. Don't take much from God to take care of things. He just struck them with blindness. You remember the story. But here's reference. Jude references this now. And you and I would be very wise to understand what is being said. Uh, do not be brainwashed by the liberal fake media today that gets you to tolerate sin. You're not supposed to tolerate it. You're supposed to stand against the evil. And uh, uh, don't, don't be deceived into that. So it says here, going after strange flesh, set forth for an example, our example, Watch the rest of it. Suffering, and here's the words, vengeance of eternal fire. Well, what kind of fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah? I've, I've seen them explain it. Oh, it must have been an asteroid. It must have been a, uh, some piece of rock coming out of the sky. I don't know what God used, but it was fire and brimstone. It was God's vengeance fire. It was judgment that fell. And uh, that's what happened. That's why they... They actually talk about the Dead Sea and calling it the Salt Sea. It's so rich in salt. And then, of course, Ms. Lot had lived there so long till she didn't want to quit shopping at Target. She didn't want to. She would got into the enjoying the lifestyle, perhaps, of maybe it was a prosperous place. Ladies, be careful of that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, she was told not to look back, but she did look back, and God turned her to a pillow of salt. When we were over there and riding the tour bus, we come out around the Dead Sea and climbing up the mountain. It's uh, climbing uphill going back toward Jerusalem, and it's in those areas where the caves are at and where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. Um, but as we go around one particular sharp curve and a big old windshield on the bus, and as it turned around the curve, you're looking kind of at, a, at the mountain sides there. And the guide quickly pointed out a big projection standing, almost a statue-like thing, pretty good size. And he said, that's a pillar of salt. He said, look at it close and you'll see Lot's wife. <laughs> well, sure enough, sort of like making a castle in the clouds, you could see the shape of a woman in the old style uh, long robe dress. And yes, you could imagine in your mind, he said, well, traditionally for however long, we don't know when it got started, but it's always been called Lot's wife. In the right place, because it says these other little cities around Sodom and Gomorrah, that's where, that's where Lot wanted to go. He didn't want to get far enough away. And he stopped too quick. And those cities were destroyed too, around about. But there's the pillar of salt, whether it's truly Lot's wife's place she was zapped by God, I don't know. But it's a good point to remember. God's vengeance fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, and fell on that filthy sin. And no, we're not supposed to have to accept it. I was in a preacher's meeting, oh, it's been a good while, three years at least. And uh, after some of the preaching, we were having discussion and uh, questions and so forth. And uh, some of the younger preachers begin to speak up like this. And I, I was sad to hear this. In fact, me and another older one or two said, <laughs> kind of straightened it out, I think. But some of the younger fellows were saying, what are we going to do? We are preaching. We know homosexuality is wrong. We know what the Bible says about it. But what are we going to do? We've got families that's got kids that's gone homosexual. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Now hear me. I feel for that family. I understand the grief they got. But you don't quit calling sin, sin. Just because you might hurt somebody. And it does hurt. It does. Now, you say, that don't ever happen in our church. It's happened plenty of times right here. In some of the pews you're sitting in right in front of me, I've seen that very thing. And my heart goes out to the families. But it didn't mean I had to trim my message. I'd rather be right with God and have somebody get their feelings hurt because I said something. Because I'm speaking biblically when I speak of it. And that's what I, I'm doing this morning. It's right here. I didn't invent that. I didn't write that. Somebody thinks the preacher sat up and wrote Jude last night. No, he didn't. He's talking about what was already written. 
and what God had, had for us. Now, think on this. Don't this update us from where we're living right now? My. And I'm saying don't grow weak in what you know is right and wrong. The Bible says, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. You know what that means? It means the majority is not always right. And the other thing is some folks claim a majority when it's not a majority. The homosexual movement today at the best is 8 or 10% of the population, and that's terrible. That's bad enough. I'm not sure it's even that much. But you'd think they were 90% the way they're beginning to rule and take over. And that's, that's, that's just wrong. I think about the old farmer that had, his, uh, had a water hole behind his house, had a pond. And the frogs were so loud and terrible at night, he finally had a machine come in and drain the pond to get rid of those frogs. He couldn't sleep. And they drained the pond. They found one big mouth bullfrog. He was making all the noise. But he had the farmer thinking he had a pond full of them. And today we, in America, we think some stuff's a majority when it's still a minority. Yeah. It's still one loud mouthed bullfrog out there hollering and, and conning us into thinking it's the majority. Yeah. It's not. And so we better stick by what not only the Bible tells us, but what even nature tells you is right and wrong. Yeah. And here's a case. Now, this is describing. Jude is describing here some historical examples, remembering, remembering what God did in letting his judgment fall upon sin. So he calls it the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We understand that. But he's also saying, I will one day take vengeance. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And we as Christians have to be willing to wait and let God do that. But the fact is that day is coming. Revelation 19, when he comes back with 10,000 of his saints, it's going to be vengeance on them that are his enemies, declared his enemies. And they're out there. There's going to be some stuff. So many of you are young enough, you're going to be here to see some stuff. Because I don't believe the rapture is going to come all that quick. I'd like for it to come today. But if it, if it takes 10 years for it to get here, there's a pile of you listening to me right now. Are going to see. We think it's bad now, but you're going to see it get even worse and worse, as the Bible says. Evil men shall wax worse and worse, Paul told Timothy. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be that way. So Jude with just 600 what, 608 words, I believe it is, uh, is picturing this thing by giving us examples, awful examples, but it's also picturing this, God will not forever. Genesis 6 and 7 there with, with Noah, he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There is an end to it, and uh, it will come. So these historical examples now, Moving into the thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, the fallen angels, yeah, there'll be, there, there's, uh, Paul warns us in Ephesians 6:12 about uh, wickedness in high places, principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, all that's going to play into it. Anybody ever watch any of this UFO stuff on TV? Some of the, do you ever watch any of that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to start a college class here, I reckon, but. I mean, I'm joking with you some, but they got some far out theories going out there right now, some big ones. And uh, while we don't go with the conspiracies and theories, we go with the Word of God. There is, listen to this statement and then watch it close. There is a little truth behind a lot of even lies Somebody says, even a broke clock is right twice a day. So there is a little bit of truth sometime that got started. Do you know a lot of the heresies in the Bible that are taught today are truths that will take place in the tribulation period that people are trying to apply now? Misplaced, but 
For instance, one of them, and I have to stop here, one of them is, uh, if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. So people teaching losing your salvation today, if you don't work for it and endure to the end, no, 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 that's a tribulation truth given to the Jews. Endure to the end of the tribulation period, not now. When you take something and misplace it, then you can go into heresy. Yes, yeah, in the Bible, but it didn't apply to you. It was written to you in this Christian church age that we live in right now. All right. You see why I'll never get through here. <laughs> you just don't listen fast enough. <laughs>